I can hear Sage, but not very well. Please start. Okay. So first of all, uh, thank you very much, Seiji and uh, all the Yamagata team for this invitation. I send my regards to all of you in uh, in Japan. Uh, as you know, we are behind, so it's about uh, 11, 12 here in Brazil uh, of, of Friday, June 6. So I'll start here the presentation. Um, which, which I'm going to talk about where uh, about endoscopic ear surgery and uh, where are we going from here the lessons learned from from the great names in history of ear surgery and what I think is going to be one of the possible futures of, of ear surgery so um, this is the Yamagata snow that I put just to to congratulate Yamagata uh, people this is the website of the working group. Uh, I think you you already know because Dave gave his presentation. And uh, feel free to access this website. It's very interesting and uh, has some videos. And I would like to congratulate also Seiji for his uh, great uh, works that he presented on Las Vegas on the last COSM meeting in the USA. There were uh, several posters, uh, one with the safety of the temperatures generated by endoscopic ear surgery and so I think it was very nice and the Yamagata group is uh, really one of the strongest group on, on uh, endoscopic ear surgery. So I come from this city which is uh, called Fortaleza. Um, uh, next week we'll have the World Cup but um, unfortunately some things are not ready yet but uh, I think it's going to be a good game and let's see. And uh, it's very far from Yamagata. It's about 18,000 kilometers. So that's one of the reasons that I, I wish I could be there, but I'm not there. I'm not uh, there in Yamagata. And let's talk about the history. And uh, this guy is called Dr. Schwartz. He is considered the father of the modern mastoid surgery. And he is considered that because he standardized for the first time the mastoid surgery, the retroauricular incision, the opening of the mastoid cells, uh, go into, into the antrum, then go into, in, into the middle ear. And mm. imagine in that time, his first operative cases, 20 patients died. 20 patients died in the first, so a, a death rate of 20%. But he was considered like a pioneer and a, a great guy because before uh, uh, Schwartz, the mortality rate in mastoiditis or in mastoid surgery was about 80 percent. So this was like 200 years ago. So it, it's important for us to understand the history and to understand where are we are, we, where are we right now, uh, to understand uh, uh, possibly the, 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 the drawbacks of some uh, procedures that were done in the past. So the, the mastoid surgery done in the past was a very, uh, I would say, primitive surgery because you were not uh, allowed to use microscopes, you're not allowed to use drills because they were afraid of the, the trauma uh, created by the burrs uh, into the cochlea. Uh, you are not, uh, you didn't have like electrical cautery, you didn't have um, uh, the ultrasonic aspirator, you didn't have any power instruments. And also you didn't have antibiotics and uh, neither you had a, a good anesthesia techniques. 
So it was a very, very brave procedure. Uh, most of the times were done because of, of automastoiditis and because of the complications of the automastoiditis. But uh, the access that was uh, gained by the mastoid to the middle ear was a very good access. So you could access the middle ear through the, the mastoid using some chisels and hammers and you could create a big cavity in order to uh, drain the, 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 the secretions, the pus, the secretions, and, and to drain other things. And there were actual temporal bone courses that you, uh, w you were taught how to hold the chisels and how to hold the hammer. And uh, of course, uh, there were a lot of problems there of the post-operative time. But uh, there were great guys also uh, like Professor Julius Lempert, which is considered the, the father of the modern uh, ear surgery. He was a Polonese uh, that uh, lived in New York uh, during the first half of the last century, and he developed some nice surgeries like the, the fenestration. Uh, the fenestration actually was developed by Dr. Holmgren in, 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 in uh, Sweden. But Dr. Lempert uh, took a three-stage operation and transformed into a one-stage operation. And as you can see, he is operating uh, there. He didn't use a microscope. He didn't believe the microscope was a good instrument at the time. He used just a frontal mirror, and he was the first one to use a drill. He uh, picked a dentist drill and uh, made some adjustments, some configurations of the dentist drill, and he was the first one to use the dentist drill. When the nurse of the, the, the hospital, the NYU hospital, uh, uh, when the nurse uh, saw that he was using a dentist drill, the nurse told the director of the hospital and he was expelled from the hospital, just for you to think. And, and it's amazing because nowadays for ear surgery, we use uh, uh, variations of the dentist drill and uh, in the past it was not, uh, this was not allowed. And this is a fenestration, he is performing the Lampert incision and he is performing actually an inside out mastoidectomy as you can see this is the canal wall and this is the mastoid and he's going to open to expose the lateral semicircular canal which is here and then to create the fenestra and he's going to create the fenestra without a microscope which is very difficult the lateral semicircular canal is there and he's going to create a, a small fenestra he created the fenestra here and this procedure was a, a very nice procedure for autosclerosis at the time and John Shee, which is one of the great fathers of ear surgery also from Memphis, from Tennessee, he was one of the first ones to use the microscope, the operating microscope, to do the stapedectomy surgery uh, also for autosclerosis. But as you can see here in this video, this is actually the first recorded video of this microscopic uh, stapedectomy. It was a very primitive microscope, as you can see, not a very fancy one like Seiji has in Yamagata. Uh, and the image quality of the microscope was not so good at the time, of course. This is 1954. So, as you can see, the image quality of the microscope was not good. So, there he was elevating the tympanometal flap, and then he was going to go into the middle ear and to do the, the stapedectomy surgery like we perform nowadays. But the image quality was not good at all. The microscope at the time didn't have a good optics, didn't have digital image, and it was a very bad image. So when he presented this at the American Academy meeting, uh, the table was composed by Dr. Shi. He was 34 years old when he presented. Dr. Coase, Dr. William House, and Dr. Lampert. All of the doctors criticized him because he was using the microscope. All of the doctors said, oh, you are crazy because you're using the microscope. This is not a good instrument to use at this time. It's a bad image. You, you shouldn't do this. But he still uh, performed the, 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 the uh, uh, stepadectomy. And nowadays, everyone uses, or most of the people uses, a microscope to perform uh, ear surgery. And of course, uh, this is a very uh, historical uh, video that I found. Uh, uh, it's going to show. This Holmgren is Dr. Holmgren, the father of modern uh, otologic surgery, which is considered also one of the fathers of, of modern otologic surgery. And this is Dr. Surdieu, Maurice Surdieu from France, other, uh, uh, also Surdieu other father. And this is uh, Dr. Lampert performing the fenestration, yeah. as you saw. Sam and this Bright is Dr. Rosen. Below uh, Dr. Rosen was the father of the mobilization of the stapes. 
he was also didn't believe in the use of the microscope. So as you can see, he is performing the mobilization of this tapis also for autosclerosis, which is very nice in order for us to understand. But the microscopes uh, gave to the ear surgery the magnification and the light that we needed for performing safe and effective surgery at the ear. So many things evolved. And the microscope was also used for sinus surgery. As you can see here, this is a microscopic ethmoidectomy in the image quality here. And there were actually some advantages when you perform microscopic sinus surgery, uh, such as uh, three-dimensional stereoscopic visualization, and also the use of two hands. You can do an ethmoidectomy very fast because you use two hands and one of the hands you use a section. So it's very fast procedure, and actually at the time, there was uh, some papers that were uh, published. This is a paper from 1986 showing the comparison between microscopic and endoscopic sinus surgery and saying that microscopic sinus surgery was actually better uh, than endoscopic sinus surgery because the image quality was uh, much better than the endoscopes at the time. And as you can see, this is a video of Dr. David Kennedy. He is a very excellent well, surgeon, but a very lousy actor. So <laughs> he is performing an explanation of, of sinus, sinus surgery. Problems. And at the time, you, you would say, okay, I'm going to operate you, but uh, you, can have, you, you can be blind. Uh, you, I can go into your brain, I can go into your internal carotid artery, I can go into your orbit, your, your eye, and um, uh, these complications seem not to be cared by the patients. And nowadays when we talk about endoscopic ear surgery, you go, oh, but you can injure the ossicular chain, oh my god, oh, and, and, and this uh, seems to be a very huge problem in some countries. Uh, uh, of course, you should never injure the ossicular chain, but uh, it's a small thing that you can correct. Even if you do uh, microscopic surgery, you can perform. And it's not a problem at all for, for those who perform microscopic or endoscopic. And as you can see, the image quality here, this is the yes, Stumbeger's movie of uh, his first dissection in the first American the course that was performed in John Hopkins' uh, 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 hospital in 1986. As you can see, the image quality of the endoscopes at the time was not also very good. So uh, there were many years a discussion throughout the world where you should do endoscopic or microscopic sinus surgery. But why endoscopic sinus surgery, I would say, prevailed in most of the countries? Of course, there are some countries that you still perform microscopic sinus surgery, and they are not wrong. But why endoscopic sinus surgery became so popular? Because you could see better. You would lose one hand, but you could see better the structures, and you could understand better the physiology and the anatomy of the corridors in the nasal cavity. And the same thing happens, and nowadays, of course, we have uh, aerodynamic surgeries and stuff like that. But the same thing happens in endoscopic ear surgery. When Dr. Tarabishi, uh, for the first time, published his first papers in 1997, the image quality at the time was not so good as we have right now. There was like one chip camera and no HD cameras. Uh, but even with those endoscopes, you could have a very nice image quality and you could understand what we call the endoscopic ear surgery basic principles. The principles of the folds, the ventilation uh, uh, pathways, which is very well described by the Modena group and uh, Dr. Daniele Marconi, Dr. Presuti, uh, Matteo and Domenico. And, and, and those physiological uh, concepts uh, came uh, with a new understanding of the anatomy and the physiology of the mastoid cells and of the birthplace and of the origin of the inflammatory disease uh, of the ear. Uh, if you think about inflammatory disease, uh, chronic otitis media, cholesteatoma, if you think about those diseases, the birthplace of those diseases is not the mastoid, it's the middle ear. But yet we use the mastoid as a conduit to the middle ear just because if you use a microscope using a transcanal access, it's very difficult to, to, to go and to see some important structures. But on the other hand, if you have an instrument that allows you to understand this anatomy and to understand this surgery and to perform a surgery with a minimally invasive approach, uh, you can create a better job and you can create a better surgery for your patient. So this, these concepts were very nice and of course, 
uh, this is a microscopic surgery and the great advantage for me uh, when talking about cholestatoma is this this is a canal wall down procedure and even in a canal wall down procedure you cannot see well the sinus tympani of the patients and now you can see the anterior uh, supratubal recesses and the anterior tympanic space so uh, you can, you have to create big cavities, you have to low down the wall onto the facial nerve, you have to understand this anatomy very well and creating those big cavities in order to remove completely the disease. But, of course, you have good results with this uh, when we talk about recurrence and residual d disease, but the cost, in my opinion, is very high. You lose the hearing most of the times. You have a cost of cleaning the cavity, of, uh, of debriding the cavity. The patient comes back very often to your office. This has also a financial cost for the, the health uh, system in Brazil and in most of the countries. And of course, you have uh, big limitations. The patient cannot fly, cannot uh, 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 go into the beach. And here in Brazil, it's a, a Fortaleza is a beach place. The patient cannot dive. It's, it's very hard, very difficult. So, uh, of course, with endoscopes, you can understand this a little bit better and you can create a little bit better cavity for the patient. This was a patient with an automastoidectomy. The cholestatoma has already created the cavity, a big cavity for you. So what we did with endoscope was just clean the cavity and to create a, a, a big cavity, but using the endoscopes, of course, and without a, a retroalicular incision uh, using uh, an entirely transcanal approach. So this is the mastoid tip here, the ma mastoid antrum here, anterior tympanic spaces here, so we are opening, and this is the facial nerve, lateral semicircular canal, and of course this is all transcanal, and this is very important, our facial nerve is there, this is the round window, oval window, and just for you to understand, oh, this is like a canal wall down procedure, but look at the depth of the sinus tympani, this is like a type C sinus tympani, very deep. So if, even if I have a microscope, this is a canal wall down procedure that was performed entirely by the disease. We didn't do anything. But even if, if I had done uh, something or lower down the wall onto the facial nerve, I would have problems to see the depth of the sinus tympani. And if I had disease in the sinus tympani, I would leave the disease inside the sinus tympani and I would have a recurrence uh, of the disease. This is the oval window, and uh, as you can see, the stapes is eroded, uh, almost totally eroded. So it's very important to understand these concepts and to understand uh, the anatomy of the sinus tympani, the anatomy of the anterior tympanic spaces, in order for you to understand uh, the disease. Of course, in this disease, we clean, we use the burr, all transcanal and all using the endoscope. Of course, you lose one hand but you can have an assistance holding the, the, the suction and we are cleaning all the cavity, uh, the, this big cavity, trying to remove all the, the remaining cells in order to create this big cavity and in order to create a, a very well stabilized uh, cavity uh, for the patient. But as you can see and you have to remember, this is all completely transcanal, there's no retroalicular incision. And this is all the way to the mastoid tip an inside-out mastoidectomy that was performed by the disease but was inspected and, and uh, using the endoscope and this is the station tube, this is an angle endoscope like a 45 degree endoscope, anterior tympanic space, the cog is here, supratubal recess, anterior tympanic space, facial nerve, uh, cochlearyform process is right here, oval window, so it's a very nice anatomy that you can understand and of course you have also small cholestatomas and I will say like this and this even with uh, 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 erosion of the tagman tympani here uh, with the dura uh, matter probably um, uh, being seen and as you can see here in this cholestatoma this was a normal tympanic membrane just with a, a retraction and the mastoid was also uh, 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 almost normal so why would you have to destroy an almost normal mastoid just to remove a disease. Of course, you have to think about the cholesteatoma matrix. There are two types of matrix of cholesteatoma, the infiltrative matrix and non-infiltrative matrix. Non-infiltrative matrix are more easy to deal with because they are like a retraction uh, sac. Uh, uh, the cholesteatoma stays in a sac and you can remove completely, unblock, do an unblock resection of the cholesteatoma sac. But on the other hand, if you have an infiltrative matrix cholestatoma, sometimes you do not have the sac, 
or the, the bone is also invaded with the matrix of glioblastoma. On those cases, you have to use a drill. Even using a, 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 an endoscope, you have to use a drill or the ultrasonic curette that Seiji uses very well in order to remove the bone which is, has the, the matrix in order to avoid the recurrence. But here, as you can see, the middle ear is almost, uh, I would say, normal. There is a blockage in the isthmus and this blockage of the isthmus may have regenerated the pressure changes that generated the retraction. And this is the incus here, the malleus, the isthmus is here. And as you can see, we are curating, not using the burr here, trying to expose the sac, the cholesterol sac, the facial nerve is there. And as you can see here, the sac is a very non-infiltrative matrix sac. So you can completely pull the sac out of the bone, out of the mastoid. And uh, of course, in this case, you have the eroded dura, the exposed dura, but this was not a problem. As you can see, oh, using an elevator, we can remove completely the sac from the bone and also from the dura. And this is a very good case to deal with. And the recurrence rates of those cases with a non-infiltrative matrix are very low. Even using a microscope, using an endoscope, are very low. And uh, here you see the dura. Oh, the dura mater is here. And we are removing, you know, peeling the sac from the dura. And after you remove the sac, you open the ventilation roots. This is the tensile fold that was closed. And then we are going to open the tensile fold and expose the supratubal recess. So opening the tensile fold and exposing the supratubal recess and then removing. And this is a, this was a very difficult case. So this is lateral semicircular canal, mastoid antrum, anterior tympanic space, dura mat exposed, supratubal recess. The ossicular chain was re, uh, was intact. So we we couldn't uh, remove the incus in this case because it was intact. Of course, we should, we could if you want, but we shouldn't. So we tried to remove the disease completely, uh, preserving the ossicular chain and then inspecting the isthmus and inspecting to see any residual disease. And of course, you have the post-operative of, of, of this patient. I think it's from this patient. This is the normal ear, which is, was not operated. Oh, normal ear, the right ear, and the left ear, what, which was that one. Only that this scar here, a trago scar to use uh, to remove the cartilage, and as you can see, this is three weeks post-operative time. It's almost completely healed the tympanic membrane and the cartilage that was used to reconstruct the the, the, the defect that we created uh, to expose the antrum of the mastoid. So it's a very stable uh, cavity, a very stable technique, and the hearing results are also very good in this case. And of course, you can understand a little bit the anatomy. Ponticulus, subiculum, funiculum, the anterior spaces. Uh, it's very important to understand these concepts, especially when we talk about cholestetoma. And then nowadays, I, I like very much this concept, which is from Stefan Ayash, the president of the Aegis, which nowadays we can have four types of ear surgery. Because you have to remember, we are not microscopic surgeons. We are ear surgeons. Sometimes a microscope may be a better tool Sometimes the endoscope may be a better tool for the disease. So there's the totally microscopic surgery that you still have to perform in some cases. Totally endoscopic surgery that you can perform for stape surgery, for instance, for uh, tympanic perforations, for instance, even for cholestatomas in some uh, types. Endoscopic assisted microscopic surgery. You start the surgery with the microscope and then you check the recesses with the endoscope. Also very nice. It's a different concept, but also very nice. And you have the microscopic assisted endoscopic surgery, which is the, the one that I think is very uh, it's better. Because you start the surgery with, with endoscope, trying to clean the middle ear, try, try to understand the disease, where the disease starts, where the burst place of the disease is, which is the middle ear. And then if you need to go posteriorly, if you need to open the mastoid, of course you lose all the benefits that you have from the minimally invasive endoscopic techniques. Uh, uh, if you have to open the mastoid, you can use a microscope. So I like this philosophy, which is Dave Pothier philosophy also, uh, the, the middle ear is a preserve of, of the endoscope and the mastoid is a preserve of uh, the microscope. And this is important because we are ear surgeons and we need to understand this to need to understand and to uh, master to work with these two in, uh, nice instruments. And let's talk about a little bit about the results. So when we search the literature about the results, uh, talking about <coughs> cholesterol thomas, when we 
when you don't use endoscopes at all, you have basically two types of surgery and two types of published papers. The papers with canal wall down procedures, which has probably in most of the papers a recurrence rate of 8 to 10 percent, and you have the canal wall up procedures. Uh, and when you do a second look procedure in the first year postoperative, you can have up to 40 to 70 percent of recurrence or residual disease. So it's a very big uh, a number for recurrence or residual disease. And of course, you have the benefits of canal wall up, canal wall down. But when we talk about endoscopes, and there was a very nice paper published by the Modern Group uh, th this last month, uh, doing a systematic review, and also this is the paper of the clinics of North America, which is also from the modern group. As you can see, the recurrence rate is about 4.8 percent, and um, in the most of the papers that were published, uh, the recurrence rate is about uh, 9 to 10 percent, which is similar to canal wall down procedures. And when we talk about our results, from 2010 to 2013, in 58 patients, 50 total endoscopic and 8 combined, we have divided the patients into three groups. Group A with a normal tympanic membrane, no recurrence, no residual disease, 65.5% of the patients. Group B is a, pa a patient that we performed the surgery, but he stayed with a perforation after the surgery, but a dry, stable ear, which is about 25.9% of the patients. And group C, we included the perforation, which are infected, perforations, not stable perforations, the retraction, the residual, and the recurrent patients, which is about 8.6%. So when we talk about endoscopic assisted procedures, even if you use a microscope, but if you put an endoscope and if you, uh, 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 you can work with an endoscope with a good skill with an endoscope, in the worst case scenario, even if you cannot remove completely the disease only using only the endoscope by a transcanal approach, you will have the recurrence rate similar to canal wall down procedures, but doing a minimally invasive procedure, most of the times without retroarticular incisions, and most of the times without the problems of the canal wall down procedures that you have a lot. Of course, you all know, you are all ear surgeons. Of course, it's one stage procedure, has a low recidivism, but the hearing results are not very good. You have to good long-term debridement, it's inconvenient to the patients, and also you have uh, created some surgeons, uh, including surgeons from Japan, had created some obliteration technique to try to reduce the size of the cavity because it's also a big uh, problem, uh, the size of the cavity. And Dave Poitier has published uh, this year in January on Laringoscope a very nice uh, uh, article on the financial economic impacts of canal wall down procedures in the Canadian health system because uh, the patient has to come very often to the office to do the cleaning and this spends the money of the system of course and uh, it's very impressive this article and if you think about the the money expend when you do a canal wall down procedure in the post-operative period for the rest of the life of the patient is a very big number and you should be aware of this also and it's very important to understand uh, this configuration and what about the future of course uh, we studied the temporal bone for 400 years, but uh, these last years, especially the modern group using the endoscope, had uh, discovered some new anatomical structures, just, just like this. This is the Petrus apex, and this is the subcochlear tunnel, which was recently described in the uh, European Archives of Otolaryngology, uh, in an article by Dr. Marchioni, Dr. Prezuti, and Dr. Dave Pothier, which is a very nice article to understand this, and of course, as we are surgeons and as we are ENT surgeons, you have to understand that you have several access to the Petrus apex, and this is actually a Petrus apex cholesterol granuloma that you can access through the nose without doing any uh, kind of access through the ear using this space between the carotid and the clivus here. And as you can see, you can go all the way. This is the transpenodal approach. The carotid is here, clivus is here, and you can do all the way. You can go to the petrous apex and open the petrous apex to marsupialize the cholesterol granuloma and then to understand the disease. And this is very important to understand. Of course, new procedures are being developed at this time using endoscope uh, as the main instrument. 
Just like this uh, procedure, the tenotomy for Meniere disease, which is a very promising procedure, and, and um, um, Dave is doing some uh, surgeries using this, it basically consists on cutting the tendons, the, the, the tensor tympani tendon and the, the pyramidal amino uh, the, the stapes tendon. Uh, in order to avoid any pressure changes in, in the cochlea and in the vestibule, in order to avoid the symptoms of many air disease. It's a very simple procedure, it's a five minute procedure using the endoscope. And uh, also, groups in, in the States are performing the surgery with good results at the time and uh, a very promising procedure for the future in order to avoid. Uh, big procedures like nerectomies or, or labyrinthectomies uh, to, to heal or to uh, um, avoid the symptoms of the Meniere disease. Of course, cochlear implants, and uh, there will be the Munich meeting soon, and we'll talk about cochlear implants using the endoscope, but the view of the oval window niche, especially in malformations, is very nice. So this is the, the round window niche, oval window niche, facial nerve is here. And with endoscopes, you can use drills and you can expose better the, of the round window membrane here when using a round window approach. This is the promontory here, the incus is here. And then you can, uh, the fustis is there, you can put the, the cochlear implant inside. And then you can put the electrode uh, inside, opening the, the, the membrane, the round window membrane. And it's a very close-up view, a better view uh, when compared to the microscope. And you can go all the way inside the cochlea to see the electrodes going in. And it's a very interesting procedure that you can also combine. You, uh, the mastoidectomy, if you want to do a traditional approach with the microscope, and then you raise a tympanometal flap, and then uh, you put the electrode inside. And it, it's a very important thing that's... I think it's important to try to master both instruments, microscopes and endoscopes, in order to try to understand. Uh, and for the future, the robotic cochlear implant, which is uh, very well performed and uh, as a test surgery in Vanderbilt University, uh, you do a completely robotic thing and you can also allow the use of the endoscope. Um, it's a very simple procedure. You don't do a mastoidectomy because, of course, we are seeing now the long-term follow-ups of the cochlear implants when you perform the mastoidectomy. You destroy a normal mastoid, and uh, sometimes you can have problems with that, like cholesteatomas, like retraction, like atelectasis of the tympanic membrane, because you are destroying a buffer that regulates the pressure changes inside the middle ear. So uh, this <laughs> cochlear implant uh, is not with a mastoidectomy and uh, it's just a drill that you go inside from the outside to the inside in a one shot and then you do the cochleostomy and you raise a tympanometal flap to put the electrode inside. So it's a very promising new technique and a very fast uh, new technique for cochlear implants. Of course, you have to pre-program the robot to uh, drill in the space between the cordal tympani and the facial nerve in order to uh, allow the, uh, any problems to the facial nerve. And the total implantable devices, especially the, the developed, it's been developed at this time, the total implantable cochlear implant, which is using a, micro, a microphone, uh, and it can be put inside uh, in a minimally invasive fashion, like raising the tympanic metal flap and putting just the microphone in contact with the tympanic membrane and the electrodes uh, using the round window. So for the future and the initial experience with the total implant uh, cochlear implant device, using the endoscope, the group from Harvard is also doing this. It's very nice and very well promising in order to allow a, a minimally invasive surgery, not destroying the mastoid air cell system in most of the patients. And this is just a schematic thing of this totally implantable. And this is the most cool thing that I saw in the last uh, a couple of months in the States. Um, a, a company that I cannot say the name at the time is developing a fully implantable cochlear implant with a nasal insertion capability using the station tube to put the implant through the nose into the middle ear using endoscopes. So imagine a cochlear implant through the nose putting the microphone at the uh, maxillary sinus because it's a very reasonable sinus. So imagine, we are ENTs. Uh, this uh, thing that we have in the States or in some countries, like, oh, you're only ear surgeon, only sinus surgery, only larynx surgery. This is not true because ear and sinus are one big thing. The physiological thing is 
identical, the mucosa is identical, and you need to understand this. And this is like a, a chip, a microchip, that you can put through the station tube on the oval window, I mean on the round window, and this can generate impulses, electrical impulses, that can stimulate the hair cells and stimulate the cochlear nerve without a mastoidectomy or with a very simple procedure. And this is not a future, it's not fiction. This is happening right now. Uh, some studies are performed right now in the States. And actually there, there is one big study that I, I didn't put the slides here, but I'm going to talk. The University of Kansas has developed a very nice way to figure out the genes that are, um, that are messed up because of some genetic problems or the genes that are messed up because of some uh, problems of the, the cells. So they are putting the DNA sequence of the hair cells, inner and external hair cells, in a virus and doing a platinotomy and putting the virus through the platinotomy like a step surgery using the endoscope in the vestibule. This virus is replicating in the cells inside the cochlea and is becoming is, is allowing the cells to recover like a gene therapy for the hair cells phase one studies is already done they did on mice and the mice were the, the deaf deaf mice they could hear in a, f a functional way now a phase two of studies is being performed with monkeys and primates in Kansas and uh, three months from now they will start the human testing so it's a very nice thing uh, for a genetic therapy using a virus as uh, like a, a very clever way to put the DNA inside uh, the, the liquid of the perilymph and the endolymph and using an endoscope, which is the most cool thing I, I, I think. So the future for this is very amazing. Of course, for inner ear surgery, for the CPA angle, neuroma surgery is very interesting, and, and the Moderna group has a very big experience on this already, uh, using a transcanal approach to go inside. And if you think about this anatomy, and this is drawing from Daniele Marconi, the new Michelangelo of ear surgery, you can understand the, the vestibule, spherical recess, elliptical recess, vestibular crest, and the cochlea, and you're going to use this in some cases. For instance, this is a case uh, that I'm going to show in a couple of minutes of a cholesteatoma with a vestibule invasion. So this is a cholesteatoma. This is trans, all transcanal approach. Oh, the cholesteatoma is here. And the cholesteatoma had a vestibule invasion. We raised the tympanum flap. And then the cholesteatoma was an infiltrative matrix cholesteatoma, which is not very good cholesteatoma. But uh, can you see it's not a, a retraction pocket cholesteatoma, it's infiltrative matrix. So this cholesteatoma, we are removing a little bit of the cholesteatoma. But when we go, this is the facial nerve, which was the recent here. Can you see the facial nerve, lateral semicircular canal? And the vestibule here was open. Can you see the vestibule open here? So we are exposing now the sinus tympani and try to work in the sinus tympani to clean the cholesteatoma from the sinus tympani. And since it's an infiltrative matrix, we decide to do a retroradicular approach and to remove the cholesteatoma also from the mastoid. And also because we couldn't see the posterior limits. So this is from the mastoid, the antrum of the mastoid, lateral semicircular canal, and we are inspecting the middle ear using the endoscope. So we are removing this. But after removing, we are using a drill. And as you can see, I'm holding the endoscope with my left hand and using the drill with the right hand. You don't need two, drill, two hands to drill. You can have an assistant, and an assistant can use the section. In the sinus cavity and skull base, we do the same thing. We use one hand to hold the endoscope, and we drill with the other hand, with no problems. And this can be done also in the mastoid. So we are trying to remove this infected bone, to remove this bone with the infiltrative mate. This is lateral semicircular canal. And we are removing the disease from the mucosa of the mastoid at this time. And then, after we clean the mastoid, we go back to the middle ear. And you still have some residual disease here at the anterior tympanic space. We're going to remove and also use the drill, putting an endoscope from the middle ear and using the drill from the mastoid. You have to think about and remember that the facial nerve is here. The facial nerve is, was the hissant here and the geniculate ganglia is here. And then we remove this infiltrative matrix and you can have a very close up view to the infiltrative matrix. And then you have the vestibule, which was already open. 
So we, we need to inspect the vesicle in the cochlea to see if there is cholesteatoma inside. So we are opening the cochlea with the uh, curette. Of course, you could use a drill, but I prefer to. So this is scala vestibuli here and scala tympani here. You have the two scala from the cochlea and you have this very close up view and you have the vestibule here. And here you have the round window uh, membrane. And as you can see inside the vestibule, there are some disease here and those white small dots here are otoconia. The otoconia are here at the spherical recess and the elliptical recess. And then we clean the cochlea once again Scala vestibuli, scala tympani, and this here you can understand the angle of insertion of the electrodes in the cochlear implants. And sometimes when you use the posterior tympanotomy, the angle of insertion is not very well, uh, it's not very good. So you can cross the membranes, you can go to the scala vestibuli and then come back to the scala tympani. Because the wrong window uh, membrane is here, uh, in this place, so the electrode goes here and then makes the curve. So this is spherical recess, elliptical recess, and vestibular crest here. This is the posterior uh, vestibular nerves uh, 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 places here. And then you can see the posterior lateral semicircular canal opening here using the angle endoscope and you can inspect there's no cholesteatoma inside. Just here we're going to use the curette and you're going to clean the vestibule and the cochlea is open, vestibule is open and the cholesterol was uh, completely uh, clean and now we need to close and we close with fat uh, and then fascia and then we reconstruct the tympanic membrane and of yeah. course uh, yeah. yes yes sorry boy you were running out so you Yes. Okay. So I'll, I'll pass those videos. This is a video of a perilymph a fistula and a CSF fistula, and I'll go all the way to the conclusion. Uh, it's not a fight between endoscope and microscope. Of course, to perform endoscopic ear surgery, you have to have a good microscopic background because you need to know the anatomy. You have to have excellent anatomy knowledge. We are in the ear surgeons and we have to have endoscopic skills and you have to understand that endoscopic ear surgery is a little bit more difficult than microscopic ear surgery. And of course, uh, then two things big uh, this year. One is the book that's going to come out very soon from the Moderna group. And the other one next year is the first World Congress on endoscopic ear surgery. And uh, this is a CNN matter. And I would like to thank Seiji and thank you all for your attention. And I hope you have liked the presentation and most of the videos are on YouTube, on the channel of YouTube. So if you want to see the vestibule movies and the, the fistula movies, you can go into on YouTube. So thank you, Seiji, and thank you very much, you all. Thank you, Jan. Yes. Thank you very much for your very, very informative lectures. Uh, we are very happy to have you today, to have you via Skype. Yes. Oh, very nice lecture. So thank you very much. Thank you, Seiji. Bye-bye. <laughs>